Welcome to the Shame Free Zone with Veronica Monet, your friendly former sex worker and certified sexologist. The Shame Free Zone is a safe place for your questions and your secrets about all things sexual. Thanks for joining us here at the Shame Free Zone. My guest today is Cozy Fabian. Cozy's a very close friend of mine. She's a colleague. She's somebody I've known for, oh gosh, I hate to admit it, but probably about 20 years. <laughs> and um, I consider her to be something of a mentor, somebody who's shaped my career and even my personal life to a large extent. Cozy, welcome to the show. Well, good morning, Veronica. I'm just thrilled to be here. Good morning, my dear. I um, I would love for the audience to hear a little bit about your... I know you want to talk about the future. You are uh, a mover and a shaker when it comes to uh, to changing paradigms and, and pushing thought forward. I, I, in a lot of ways, I think of you as a, a great philosopher, as well as an amazing storyteller. But I wonder if you might uh, grace our listeners with a little background about your... Um, your life, because it's very interesting. You knew some of those guys from Cannery Row? and uh, Not quite Cannery Row. That's a, a little before my time, but I did know some of the rock and rollers, and I was involved with uh, radio and uh, the rock and roll business back when it was, uh, before it was an industry, back uh, sort of in the late 60s and early 70s. And, um, and then was a war correspondent, uh, Briefly, you may have seen the film Salvador with James Woods as a war correspondent, and uh, I actually went on that trip with Richard Boyle, who who was the hero. But they they wrote me out and put another character in called Doctor Rock. But, well, how uh, dare them! I know, I know. It was an Oliver Stone movie. I, I'm not quite sure. It, it actually was very difficult for me at the time. Um, but, um, and I've just been writing about it, which is why it's on my mind. I'm thinking, God, gonzo journalism, we should call it gonza journalism. Um, but then um, our paths crossed, as you know, because my own spiritual quest, I uh, got sober, as they say, um, golly, 26 years ago now, and was desperate enough to need a God and had um, pretty much discarded the Judeo-Christian God in my teens. Uh, Europe was very big on existentialism and atheism and agnosticism, much more so than here, I think. That was in the 60s. Um, so I needed to find something that worked for me, and as a, a, an amateur historian, I went to the library and... I discovered the myths of the ancient Near East, which were the myths before Judeo-Christianity. And I found there a version of womanhood, which I had not encountered in the society that we move in. And that version of womanhood, essentially... um, was based on the idea that, um, well, here we are in the shame-free zone, was based on the idea that sex was nothing to be ashamed of. On the contrary, desire was considered a divine force, whether it was in plants or humans. Um, And um, desire was considered a divine force and uh, there was even in some cultures the idea of the wondrous vulva as it was called was the the symbol that was worshipped which is very different to you know the cross with the dead man that we have today so um i and and the goddesses of the ancient world i discovered um, all the things that had got me into trouble, all the things that had put me at cross purposes with the society I lived in, the fact that when we share these characteristics, I was adventurous, I was um, sexually generous, um, I was um, defiant, um, all things which certainly aren't modeled by the Virgin Mary, you know, which is, which is our divine figure. 
So suddenly I find goddesses um, that are just like me. And so everything that had got me into trouble suddenly is divine. And um, and I just resonated so strongly to the myths and the poetry that um, it kind of became my religion in some ways. And then when I was laid off about seven years later, I had encountered the idea of sacred prostitution in my studies of the ancient world, which did exist through you know thousands of years and thousands of miles in one form or the other. Basically, the idea that... Um, Sexuality and sexual pleasure was a pathway to the divine rather than an obstruction to the divine, which is how Christianity sees it. And that there were, you know, officers of the temple, priestesses, even priests in some cases, who facilitated this process of accessing the divine through sexuality. And... Um, so I was laid off, and uh, I knew that if I went back to doing the work I had been doing, doesn't matter what it was, it wasn't the right work for me. And I felt that to try and do that anymore would be like the image that kept coming to my mind. Um, I don't know, as a child, you may have studied, you know, the history of children working and they used to send children and ponies down coal mines. It always horrified me as a child. And I felt as if uh, for me to go back to work at that point would be putting myself back down the pit. Oh. And I didn't think I'd come back up. And, um, and I wanted to write. I wanted, I'd never had a chance to explore my creative life, um, or, or certainly not since I got sober, not in any real way. And... Um, so I decided to um, make the big leap and to become a prostitute, uh, basing my work entirely on the idea of sacred prostitution. I didn't know anyone in the business, and that was both an advantage and a disadvantage. You know, it was a disadvantage because of the loneliness and alienation, but it was an advantage because I was able to work uh, entirely intuitively and according to you know, my idea of what was spiritually and morally correct. So nobody mentored you. Nobody showed you how to do it. Nothing. You just jumped in by yourself. I did. I, as somebody who was mentored <laughs> and worked, I apprenticed to a, a lover for nine months before I went out on my own. I just That's mind-boggling to me. I to tell you the truth, looking back, it's mind-boggling to me, too. <laughs> God, I was so driven. I mean, I was just possessed with this idea. It's kind of like, you know, close encounters of the third kind. That was my mountain that I was carving everywhere, um, with this idea of sacred prostitution. And I felt, in a strange way, uh, that I was singularly... I felt it needed to be explored, this idea of honorable prostitution. And uh, this idea of womanhood that, you know, was was very different to, to what I'd grown up with. And um, it seemed that I was very qualified to do it, in part because I had no family. So I had no one to shame. And the gift of that is that in becoming um, a sacred whore and following my bliss, Joseph Campbell was very influential on me. He was my mentor, Joseph Campbell. But in uh, following my um, following my bliss like that, um, golly, I just lost my thread. Did I you know Joseph Campbell personally? Um, oh. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, I said, did you know Joseph Campbell personally? No, no, no. But he had a TV series on um, The Power of Myths, I think it was called, ah. in the in uh, 80, 89. Oh. And I started work within uh, about six months of that series, and he did two things for me. He showed that you could be a comparative mythologist. He showed that... Um, you know, going from, from myth to myth and looking at the underlying theme with the help of unions, actually, uh, was a viable way to go, which is what I've been doing by myself. 
And he also really emphasized um, kind of a magical thinking that if you follow your bliss, uh, if it's the right thing to do, the universe will support you. So uh, I decided to do that. And, oh, yeah, it was the thing about being qualified and not having family. So what this move enabled me to do was to transform, to transmute loneliness and grief, you know, the lo- the loss represented by not having family was transmuted into freedom and opportunity. And um, I think that was very, you know, that, that was not only just healing on a personal level, it kind of indicated there was something right happening, you know. See, it always amazes me that you and I both started working as um, escorts in 1989. Because um, it's about 1990 or 1991 when I meet you. Right. And at this point, I mean, it was the information that you, you know, I took your class to sac- about sacred prostitution and was just blown away. Because my introduction into the industry was strictly about um, sex and money. Right. And, you know, because um, my the person I apprenticed to was basically all about money and, um, and uh, she was a swinger. She and her husband were swingers. So they were coming from a totally different paradigm. And um, for myself, because my, my po- politics were verging on lesbian separatism, I had a really hostile relationship with my clients for that first year. Right. And then I meet you, and I take your workshops, and I start hearing about this wondrous vulva. Well, nobody had ever told me that my genitals were wondrous. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Wondrous was not the word used. No, my mother said, wash down there, but hurry up and don't touch it for too long. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, and it's just culturally even for people who weren't religious and, and were not um, necessarily coming from a sex is bad thing, the culture was still really transmitting this idea that female anatomy was, um, as far as women's genitals, was kind of dirty or uh, dark and mysterious and, and nobody talked about it. Right. Right, and we didn't bleed, and um, women weren't pregnant, they were expecting, I mean, you know, there was a whole, there was a a very thick veil over everything that uh, was lifted by this idea. And it's interesting, though, what you say about the hostility to clients, because when I started, I was kind of a smug feminist, and my, at, at best, was patronizing towards men. But then... Through my work, uh, I realized that, well, if I'm going to claim spiritual heritage, I really have to grant it to my clients. And if I have a wondrous vulva, then they have a divine phallus. And each man is a divine phallus. So I would sort of start with the, the core of the man, you know, his spirit and his cock. And and then work out from there, I suppose. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, granting divinity. Um, you know, if I'm going to claim it, then you have to grant it. And, uh, and the, working as a sacred whore, I came up with this idea that, rather, you know, because as feminists, we were all point at back then, everyone was pointing their fingers at men and saying, bad, bad, and violent, violent, and we can't have violence. That was sort of the dirty word. Like, sex was the dirty word for women, you know, violence was the dirty word for men. And the, the accusatory tone made me uneasy. So I thought, well, if there were integrity to this thing, what might it be? And that's a question that I bring to a lot of things when I see fingers pointing. If there were integrity, what might it be? So if there were integrity to the violence of men, what might it be? And the idea I came up with is that, in a sense, in women, that, you know, there's a holy whore at the center of all women. We all carry this holy whore that is, you know, a a divine uh, pathway to the divine that is the divine. And I think all men, and, and that it's all about our sexuality, but that our sexuality has been co-opted and abused and misshapen and uh, bought and sold and it's nothing like, you know, it's pure spirit. 
And with men, I think men have at heart a sacred, a sacred warrior. And that at heart, oh, actually I would call it a sacrificial warrior. And that is that in their heart, they will die for a cause they believe in. And I cannot fault them on this. This is surrender to the nth degree. So I have to honor that. So I have this theory that, you know, in the heart of all women is a holy whore that's been misshapen and co-opted. And at the heart of all men, there is a sacrificial warrior that has been co-opted, abused, misshapen, bought and sold by the powers that be. But that is actually honorable, you know, in at heart. I, I think that's beautiful. I really do. I mean, uh, in a lot of this, um, I see an honoring of the physiology of men and women. Right. Where, you know, where women uh, really do, they bring life to this planet. And and I know that it's, it's really difficult for people to understand how prostitution could be, lead, you know, linked to procreation. But, of course, as we know, you know, years and years ago, there was that aspect of it as well as non-procreative sex. Both of those things have existed for a long time, and this whole honoring of the, the female body and all of its capacities. Right. Um, and, and then, you know, we have sexual dimorphism in humans. Males are bigger and stronger by and large. Absolutely. And then what, is that, what does that mean? <laughs> right, which gets us to today's topic. Yes, I which know you want to talk to us today about gender. And, uh, yeah, what I call it this idea that, you know, different bodies, different worlds. And one of the great influences in my work, actually, this idea of men and women being so very different, um, but only the male body and version of humanity um, has been entrenched in our culture. And someone once described culture as the stories we tell about ourselves. And I think that's a great description of culture, whether it's in, you know, movies or religions or books mm. or yeah. or jokes around the bar or whatever. It's the stories we tell about ourselves. So we move in a male culture, and I was, you know, trying to give shape to what would a female culture look like. And... Uh, there was a woman called Dr. Carol Gilligan out of Harvard Edu School of Education, and uh, nearly 30 years ago now, she started publishing um, research showing the, the inherent differences of boys and girls. And the research then was all psychological because we didn't have um, the scientific techniques we do now, you know, brain scans and chemical analysis and all the other ways they have of, of delineating the human body. So back then it was just based on behavior. And what she showed all those years ago is that boys and girls, and therefore men and women, have inherently different morality systems. Not that either is right or wrong, but we have different morality systems. And she calls the male system is the principle-based system. And that means that uh, it's about uh, truth, it's about right and wrong, uh, it's about uh, absolute abstracts. Um, it's about terror, freedom, you know, all those things. It's how we operate today, actually. But the female morality system, she called care-based. And... Um, Women, if necessary, what it comes down to is that we will break the law, if necessary, to see that someone is taken care of. We see taking care of people as more important than teaching them what is, than standing up for a principle. Mm. So well, that's like that has been borne out um, with the sort of biochemical and brain research, some of the more interesting, uh, just in 2006, I think, they showed that uh, in a, a study where you set up pairs and you establish that the other person um, is a cheat, right? Uh, so that small electric shocks are... Um, are given to this other person, and it's in your power whether it's given or not. And what they found that uh, when, when it's just a normal person, no cheat, no good or bad, 
uh, women feel enormous empathy for the person being given the electric shock. Men also feel enormous empathy for the person being given the electric shock. Then as soon as they put in the idea that this other person broke the law, you know, they cheated in some way. I mean, that's, you know, irrefutable. It, this is shown. Um, and then, and, and so then the electric shock is given as punishment, justified punishment. And what they've shown is that for women, that feeling of empathy is never overridden. We still feel that shock in the other person. For men, the empathy is completely wiped out, and there are uh, pleasurable feelings for the revenge. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Very scary. Yeah. So, you know, and it's not that one is right or wrong. It's just, you know, so obvious to us that we need to incorporate the, the female version of reality as well as the male. Um, I've actually come, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of our listeners have too, but I've, I've come face-to-face with that with, you know, my own male partners. Uh, I'm thinking of one in particular who's just like really rah-rah for America kind of thing, yeah. you know. And if somebody violates that and does, if they're not patriotic, they're not flying the flag or whatever, it's all of a sudden, I mean, the attitude is just so angry and like this person needs to be punished. And, right. and you know, and of course what comes up for me is just like, why is that such a big deal to you? Right. But I, I, sometimes I think I see some of that same uh, thinking and emotional uh, content when it comes to being a fan of organized, you know, sports. Uh, it, it's, I've seen, you know, the whole idea of picking a side right. and being very loyal to your side. Right. right. And um, and I sometimes wondered if women don't have a hard time relating to that because we really haven't had a side. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, whether one group of men win right. uh, over another group of men, how how does that really change our lives? In, you know, in a patriarchy where women have been dominated, you're just gonna trade one dominator for another. Right, right. Yeah, it's because um, what they have established irrefutably is that testosterone is directly linked to competitiveness. And it's shown that women with more testosterone are more competitive. And um, so if you just don't feel the competitive, you know, if win- <laughs> there's many women that the winning-, winning doesn't do anything for them. Mm-hmm. So, when, you know, but for men it really does. And, of course, they're getting the vicarious thrill. You know, they're watching their champion out there. It's an extension of their own ego. Right. And um, and for a while they're all is right with the world. You know, it's right and wrong and it's simple and everything's reduced to this sports metaphor, which we love to carry over into other things. And it's entirely... Uh, a male version of reality. Carol Gilligan calls it the male voice society. We move in a male voice culture. And that um, another thing her research showed is that adolescent girls going into, well, girls going into adolescence, into this male voice culture, when they start to bleed, when they become sexual, um, they lose all certainty about themselves because suddenly the stories don't fit. And so they go from being 11-year-old girls who are not afraid of um, confrontation, who are not afraid to say what they like and dislike, who want to take on responsibilities for the things they care about. Suddenly, at the age of 15, the same girls don't know what they like anymore. They don't want to assert themselves. They're focused entirely on getting the love of boys. That's the irony. They lose themselves in relationships. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing to support them to keep their independent selves. It's changing, but it's changing, you know, and that's the good news. It, things are changing. They are. They are, but it's still... So, so one of the things that, you know, you're, the the thoughts that you are working with right now are intersecting with the, my work right now, too, because um, I'm teaching workshops and, and giving lectures about um, peace, you know, how, how to achieve uh, a nonviolent uh, society. And a lot of that I draw from, um, you know, studies about uh, matrifocal cultures mm-hmm. and also, uh, you know, whether this be human or, or ape, but um, just the only, uh, whole idea that when we have the um, male influence balanced with female power, right. that uh, what t- tends to always happen is a more peaceful community. And um, Functioning. What, what do you think about that? 
I, I think you're absolutely right, and it brings, you know, a whole bunch of things to mind. Um, one of which would be that uh, some of the inherent differences, the peace would show up in response to crisis. We know about fight or flight, right? It was all fight or flight. It turns out that's a male response. What do you know? There is a female response. And this is, I think, what you're referring to in part. It's, it's the hormone oxytocin. And when oxytocin is released uh, in response to crisis, they call it tend and befriend. It makes you gather, uh, gather close to the people around you. You gather the children, you gather the people around you in response to uh, crisis. And oxytocin is released in lactation, is released in orgasm, uh, it's the bonding hormone. So, uh, and that has been left out of our morality system altogether. You know, oh, response to crisis, you've got to kill them or run away. It's like, no, maybe we could work something out here that keeps the children safe on both sides. I think that's something that female biology is much more likely to make happen. And that is, uh, you know, if, because I've been studying the uh, bonobos, which is uh, the ape that shares most of our DNA. It's uh, one of our closest living relatives. The chimpanzee also is, but the chimpanzee is all on the male dominator system, so they have rape, murder, war, um, infanticide that kill their babies. But you go to the bonobos where you've got a matrifocal culture, and that's exactly what they do when they're faced with crisis. If they come across, a, say, like a sugar cane field, and uh, this is supposed to be a really prized food source for them, and there's another neighboring tribe who's also happened to, uh, you know, across this sugarcane field at the same time. If they were chimpanzees, there'd be a bloodbath. And mm-hmm. it might result into a war that would last for four years. They documented a, a chimpanzee war that went on for four solid years. But with the bonobos, they um, have an orgy. Right. <laughs> and then everybody eats together. Right. And, uh, and so that definitely sounds like uh, tend and befriend to me. Yeah. <laughs> and you got a lot of oxytocin going on. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's, it's, but it's a, hard, it's a hard thing to get people to, um, to think about that because there's so much fear that if we don't take sides and we don't uh, hurt our enemies, that somehow or another we're going to get hurt. What do you, mm-hmm. what do you um, think the solution to that might be? Oh, golly, I don't know what the solution is. Um, you're, you're the one who's working on the solutions. But, um, <laughs> okay. I would, uh, oh, what was I just about to say? Um, I think something interesting about the, I think it's the chimps. Um, oh, yeah, you know, we have this idea of survival of the fittest, and that tends to be trotted out to justify violence, war, um, revenge, all those things, you know, that right. extra size. Right, because a lot of people say that this is evolutionary and you can't get right. around it. It's always been there's, survival of the fittest. But there's a big misunderstanding here. They, people think survival of the fittest is the contemporary understanding of the word fit, which means um, big and strong and healthy. It means I can bench past 300 pounds, right? Fit, in the Victorian sense, means the most appropriate, as in this coat fits well or doesn't fit well. Hmm. Uh, Or it is fitting that something happens or doesn't happen. So survival of the fittest means survival of the most appropriate and what they're uh, the most successful. And what they're finding uh, time and again is the place of compassion and helping people that there are, um, which, you know, are evolutionary advantage. People are last waking up going, oh, duh, I guess taking care of the children maybe helped us as much as going out and hitting other guys on the head, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and now the, the, the contemporary science is showing that the brain does light up when it does something good for someone else, that we immediately feel reward in men and women. And that is because it's an evolutionary advantage to help other people. And that has been left out of the equation altogether. It's just, you know, survival of the fittest, bang, bang, bang. No, it's survival of the fittest, what will take care of the children best. Wow. So, and so redefining this word fit. 
this is this is very much what you did for me, um, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, when it, when you and I um, first met. I guess it wasn't quite 20 years ago. I think it was 17 years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> because you redefined for me what my genitals were. Because I thought of them as being something, as one of two things. They were either something that was easily damaged that I had to guard for my life. Very, the most precious thing I have, and I have to make sure nobody ruins it. Right, right. Um, there was that, that, that thing going on. And then, of course, the other thing was that it was uh, dirty and nasty and somehow or another the seat of all sin. Right. Well, that's what the Bible tells us. It does. It does, but through, you know, you educated me to the idea that of the wondrous vulva, and this was, to me this was just such a revolutionary idea that my genitals could be beautiful and holy and a doorway to the divine. Right. That um, it changed my whole relationship with myself and sex and with the op- and with with men. I you know I, I didn't consider them the enemy anymore because there wasn't some way that they were going to be able to damage me. Right. Yeah. Good thinking. <laughs> Yeah, because but yeah, it used to be if you had sex with a man, he won, you lost. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. And then the dwarfing type feminism, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so I'm hearing something similar here with this idea. We redefine the survival of the fittest. I would have never I would have thought, well let's just throw that out, but you're actually redefining it so that we take a closer look at what does it mean to be fit. Right. What is fitting? Yeah, it's not that we are fit. It's it's what behavior is fitting. Amazing. So that puts another another. And it's like this assumption of nuclear family. I mean, I think it's the chimps. You would people would look at the aggressive behavior, and say, oh, well, it's survival of the fittest, and the aggressive chimps are passing on their genes. Like like we all you know wake up in the morning saying, oh, I've got to pass on my DNA today. <laughs> It's like, no, I want to get laid. I mean, that's as close as it's come. Oh, no. They want to pass on their DNA. Yeah. Because, you know, animals don't have orgasms or anything. But in fact, but in fact, what they're finding is that the DNA getting passed on is from the less aggressive chimpanzees. That while the apes are fighting each other and spending all that energy establishing hierarchies, there are other little apes that are cruising around the edge and they're either passing through or they're less aggressive and they spend a little time grooming the females while the other guys are fighting and then they get to have intercourse with the females and in fact it's their DNA that's getting passed on <laughs> up the fight. Oh, that's great. What about them apples? Yeah. No, no, it's, it's true. Now, of course, with the chimpanzee, that translates, then the females have to live in isolation because they're so worried that the dominant male is going to kill their babies because their babies aren't his. Well, 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 it makes them fertile again. That's the thing. When, you're tra- when you stop, when they stop lactating, when they stop taking oh, yes. their baby, they become fertile. Absolutely, absolutely. But, um, but the, yeah, at this point, the uh, scientists do believe it. Huh? It's not pretty out there, that's for sure. No, it's not. But the, it's a great thing about the bonobo. You know, they've evolved in a totally different direction. So since everybody's having sex openly and freely without having to compete for it, um, the, um, the males... Um, Develop these huge testicles so that when they ejaculate, they they produce a lot of sperm, <laughs> and that's how they compete. I think that's just so much more sensible than <laughs> what. <laughs> uh, they'll like, be wearing cod pieces. Talk about you know it's funny because we have this metaphor societally that um, if you are going to be a, a brave warrior type man, then you're going to have a really good you know big set of balls. Right, right. And, and actually, the more violent ape is the one with the smaller balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It's all so fascinating. So yeah, here we are, men and women in um moving in a different world and um it's things like um they've established that women see more colors red or more red colors than men. Women have a better sense of smell than men. Now, with the, the red, you were telling me about this uh, last week. It, does that have something to do with blood? I would guess, uh, you know, to ask what is the evolutionary purpose of women being able to distinguish different shades of red, and that would be that uh, reading, I would say, I would call it reading the language of blood. 
uh, you know, all what we call the blood mysteries uh, with women, whether it's menstruation or uh, childbirth or whatever, to be able to read the difference between healthy blood and non-healthy blood. Whereas in the male reality, you know, it's just, um, it's blood and it's either too much and you're dead or it's not too much and you're not dead, but they don't <laughs> need to read it, you know, it's, Whereas I think women really need to be able to, to read for medical reasons, health reasons, need to be able to read the different shades of red or blood. I wonder if that could explain why some men, it seems to me a lot of men, are kind of afraid of menstrual blood because it's all blood to them. They don't make a distinction between that and, and other And so many more men are colorblind, too. Oh, so more so men are colorblind? Maybe it's green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows? And then you said women have a better sense of smell, too. Women have a def- better sense of smell, it's generally agreed. Um, and there's also interesting things like um, good smells and bad so, so you've got a smell of roses and a smell of vinegar. Um, in women, the smell of roses will block pain receptors. And the smell of almonds, sweet smell, will block pain receptors. This doesn't happen in men. Sour smells like vinegar will increase pain in a women in women, uh, but not in men. But, but it immediately brings to my, you know, the, the man arriving with a bunch of roses. <laughs> it's, yes, right. And so no, it's not red roses, right? Doesn't have a headache. Well, she really doesn't have a headache, whether you know it was real, ever real or not. Um, yeah, it's just the more they discover, and just. This weekend, I saw a study showing that gay men and women's brains are more alike than gay men and straight men, and lesbians and straight men are more alike. So lesbians are more likely to go fight or flight, oh. even though they're women. Then, I mean, I don't know if they've done the same full testing, but... Um, so this is what they're beginning to look at now. You know, now that we've established just how different men and women are uh, physiologically, right. um, now that because it's an axis, so now they're looking at the sort of the people in between, and uh, and one gets a sense that there's a lot of wisdom and knowledge to be had about us all from examining gay people. You know, men and women it tells us a lot about ourselves. That's um, uh, that's amazing too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So red roses, man. That's a, so if that that hits a woman on a lot of different levels. If she's able to di- distinguish between all these different colors of red, and then she's got this enormous sense of smell, right. and then add to that the fact that roses actually make women feel better. Right. But, uh, no wonder that has uh, that's a, a tradition that's been with us for a long time. I'm thinking. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I think you know roses are associated with Aphrodite. Um, and Aphrodite is a goddess of, of love. love and art and poetry, culture in many ways, love and culture. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about some of the goddesses? Uh, sure, I'd love to. The interesting thing about Aphrodite is that she was the goddess of love, but um, uh, she had priestesses called Hori. How about that? H-O-R-A-E was the plural. And uh, it's where we get our word whore, or it's certainly connected to so this, a cognate of the word whore. And uh, the whore were her priestesses, but whore were also the seasons. And so Aphrodite uh, represents um, not love so much as transient love. You know, she, for Aphroditic love is all about the, the sort of heart-stopping beauty of spring, that will inevitably be followed by a winter. That, that's the nature of Aphro- Aphrodite's love is seasonal. And I think one of the problems of our society when it comes to, you know, our blessed uh, relationships that we spend so much time and effort on is that we've taken this golden spell of Aphrodite, this desire that the ancients worshipped in and of itself, and we've burdened it with, you know, lifelong commitment, mortgages, children, schools. And then 10 years later, people look around and say, where did the love go? And it was never meant, that was never meant, it was never meant to be that. You know, it, it's a, 
a transient magic spell. The, the ancients understood it as a spell. In fact, um, our word fascinating yeah. comes from the Latin word fascinum, and a fascinum was a spell that it was all, and you would carry its symbol around your neck like we might wear a crucifix, right? A little thing. But the little thing that, that this, what symbolized that spell was um, a penis and balls, a hard-on with balls. It was the sacred phallus again. And uh, so the fascinum, and it was, fascinum was also Latin for spell. So it was this lovely idea of, you know, an erection. Does the erection cause the spell, or is it the spell that causes the erection? But, but either way, it's sort of a magical process. And the Greeks would have stone uh, phalluses, um, you know, at crossroads and, and at street corners in their cities, and you would rub the head for luck as you went by. <laughs> I could just see that at Carl and Cole here, a nice stone phallus. <laughs> like, they, they need those in San Francisco. <laughs> they do. I don't think the Home Improvement Association would go for it. <laughs> like, they got... Painted pigs up in Seattle. They should have painted palaces yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, they'd be popular. What about but, the story of Lilith? Ah, uh, that's our favorite, isn't it? Lilith, it is, um, and you tell it so well. Lilith, I think, embodies um, non-fertile sexuality. The only sexuality women have been allowed all these years, we've touched on this, is fertile sexuality. You can have sex if you have children. And... Um, but in fact, as you know, 50% of the sexuality is non-fertile. We don't get pregnant. The idea is that you have mental children. You have ideas rather than mere, real children. So Lilith was um, the first woman made by God wasn't Eve. The first woman made by God was Lilith. And, um, God, it's been a while. Um, so... God, there's a couple of versions, actually, of this story. But essentially, you started off with Lilith, Adam and Lilith in the Garden of Eden. And everything was fine until it came time for sex. And then there was a problem because Lilith refused to lie beneath Adam, which in the missionary position, as we call it. And that apparently was insisted upon by the Jewish patriarchs, which would have been, you know, the ones in power in the Old Testament. This is from the Old Testament. So Lilith refuses to lie beneath Adam in the missionary position. Adam is horrified. God is horrified. Um, Lilith does not relent. So out says God and out says Adam. And Lilith is cast out of um, the Garden of Eden. And then after that, as we know, they made, you know, a more subservient woman out of a, a rib of Adam uh, and called her Eve, and she knew her place. And um, it was then decided that the pain of childhood was uh, all women's fault and that we deserved it. It was proof that we were uh, despised by God. So uh, Lilith, uh, where though when she was cast out of heaven, she uh, hadn't relented. She's cast out, and she flies away. She has these magnificent wings. She flies away to live in the caves by the Red Sea, where she couples with demons, and presumably in any position she wishes. <laughs> and you see this figure. She appears. She has huge uh, wings, this horned crown that the divinities would wear, um, and... Um, uh, bird's feet, but huge, like an eagle's, you know, raptor's feet that would just tear a body apart. I mean, you know, this isn't a pretty girl. And um, so she very much represents, I think, um, what was lost. When she was banished from our mythology, then um, she was banished from our psyche. And of course, as the unions, you know, have shown us, I think, so effectively, that these Mythic figures um, tell the stories we carry within. And I know that when I spoke about Lilith and when I spoke about the sacred prostitute, so many women came up to me and said, I always knew there was something else. Or I dreamt of something else. But they were just hearing the stories for the first time. 
but it's not anything, you know, it's that feeling of recognition. Like, yeah, I always knew that there was a Lilith in me. I always knew that there was a figure who would rather couple with demons. I mean, I used her as a model in that, because there's another version of Lilith where they say, um, she, let me see if I can get this right. Um, she refused to couple with demons. Um, Oh, yeah. So she declares herself a demoness in defiance. Um, she declares herself a demoness, and she utters the ineffable name of God. You're never meant to speak his name. You know, Judaism and Islam still carries this idea. So she, she announced his ineffable name and then flew away to couple with demons. So as a model, I took, I took that as a model for becoming a prostitute. I decided that I would speak the ineffable name, which for me was Wondrous Vulva, and I would declare myself a demoness, um, which I did by declaring myself a prostitute. Uh, it also is mentioned in this myth that she made so making herself invisible to Adam. And I took that to mean, um, by becoming invisible to Adam, I, what that meant was I put myself outside of the legal system. Uh, I was also, you know, there was no help out there either, but I, I moved myself out of the side of Adam and, um, and then flew away to couple with demons who I prefer to call clients. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the um, you know, one of the things that struck me about the classes that you were teaching um, in the early 90s about sacred prostitution was that a, a large percentage of the women who came to that were not uh, escorts nor were they aspiring to be escorts. These were women who needed to have the um, mythological richness that your stories provided um, to balance their own um, you know, corporate lives or mm -hmm. married lives, whatever, you know, whether they were working as career women or... or um, as mothers and homemakers, that th this was something that was really important to them, and, and that really kind of surprised me. <laughs> well, you know what's funny now is that um, I turned on Oprah Winfrey yesterday, and there they are, all breathing into their wondrous vases. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, twenty years later, at last, you know, the world is catching up with us a little. But yeah, it's always it's this idea of moving in a male voice culture. So as soon as you get the female voice out there. All females respond. You know, it's, it's, we had been invisible to ourselves for the last 2,000 years. You know, and I think America is interesting because it's so Protestant. It is so Protestant, meaning there is no female divine. There's no female what? Divine. Divine, oh, yes. Right, no, right, right. Because, you know, growing up, even Church of England, in England, you know, you've got. 800-year-old churches and, um, you know, all the the rich panoply of uh, religious stuff and you have statues of the Virgin Mary. You don't have the emphasis on Jesus. Here, it's, there it's about God and Mary is included. Here, it's just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's just patriarchy, patriarchy, patriarchy. And you combine that with this sort of aesthetic sense of oh, we don't want any art or beauty in our churches, you know, which is Aphrodite thrown out. But whereas it used to be that the beauty and glory of a, a, a fully candlelit cathedral with its stained glass windows and the jewels flashing off the archbishop's uh, clothes wasn't just a sign of corruption. It was a reflection of divinity. You know, these people live in mud huts, and suddenly they come in, and this is my ancestors living in mud huts, and they come in, and they're seeing more brightness than they have ever seen in their lives. And it was the duty of priests and priestesses, depending on the religion, to make themselves look as glorious, you know, in the literal sense of the word, glorious as possible. So we miss that in America. We have this dry, ascetic male mm. it's almost as if we're all in boot camp yeah, <laughs> yeah know, saying, you know, I, I don't know it's... I was thinking the other day about how um, um, Americans tend to um, 
brag about suffering. They, they brag about working, for, you know, and not going on vacation and, and, oh, I haven't had a vacation in years or I never take time off. And I hear a lot of people bragging about this. Right, 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 right. And I was thinking, God, we need to really shift this around. I'd like people to start bragging about it. I took four vacations this year. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, that's called living anywhere but America, you know. This, this, uh, and again, it's that Protestant, you know, work ethic. Yes, that um, is so ridiculous. It, it is. It's very much about you know. But this is the of all the countries in the world, this is probably the most sexually repressed as well. Well, I certainly among the Western countries, it's um, it's. Uh, but I tell you, an odd thing though. Um, for all that repression, it's always been, American girls have always been the most precocious. I mean, going back to when I was a girl, uh, American girls are always, you know, dressed up and sexualized much, much earlier than, than in other cultures. Huh. Well, that seems... You know, a 15-year-old American girl would have been, uh, you know, dressed as a young woman, a 15-year-old when I was young... English girl was still a schoolgirl, and uh, now it's probably happening at 11 and 12. But, but still, there's a sexualization, external sexualization, that's much more obvious and earlier here. I think the thing that bothers me about our co- current culture is, is that it says it's sex, and sexualized, I think, is a great word, um, but it lacks any uh, female voice. So, you know, a lot of times the like, girls will... You know, the, the thing that's popular right now is kissing another girl. They even, even got a song out right now. I love that song. I like it too. I kissed a girl and I liked it. It's a, yeah, cute, it's yeah. a cute song. But it, it so much of it seems like it's it's about the audience. Like, who's watching me kiss this girl? Right. Um, and has, is it turning on my boyfriend or is it sexy? Is it hot? Does it make me cooler in? But it, it, young girls still haven't connected with their own authentic sexual desire. Uh, right, but they're young girls, you know. Um, but I, I know what I know what you're saying. It, I, I mean, I actually take heart. I, what I'm hoping is that the young are moving towards ultimately having children uh, among groups of friends rather than the nuclear family. That's oh. my. So you were excited about that thing that just happened with the high schools, huh? Uh, right, but they're, they're, they're older than 16. <laughs> oh, yes, I gotcha. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, you know so a, a group of six thirty year olds say, get together and, and draw up a contract to bring up, you know, a child um, uh, rather, rather than, than two. You know, oh, two. I love your take on that. Because, yeah, exactly, because, you know, obviously... Um, they young, they're young, they don't have any resources, they haven't been able to develop that other aspects of their lives, but they were on to something. Right. On to something about the idea of women living in community with each other. Right, right. And um, instead of trying, you know, to drag a reluctant young man who maybe really does still want to spread his seed right. <laughs> into, into the idea of, uh, you know, settling down and being a provider. And they've seen the struggles of single motherhood. You know, our society has not changed to support single motherhood. America, I believe, is the only... American Swaziland, American Swaziland, are the only countries with no state-provided um, maternal leave. Yes, yeah. Isn't that amazing? No, it's not, well, not it's the only not. country in the West. The it's, only country in the world that does nothing for new mothers. It's just nothing. It's not woman friendly. <laughs> no, it's not. Or children friendly for all this talk of family values, you know. It's... Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. Family values, but we're building prisons and, and, and doing war instead. So, uh, so, yeah, so we need uh, to get the oxytocin uh, back into the system and this idea of the, the female voice and the female morality and the female worlds and... Uh, and the grandmothers. I want to see more wisdom of the grandmothers, you know? Absolutely. Wouldn't that make so much more sense? I think that's lovely when the elderly take care of the, the young. It's a shame we've all got so separated. But I did see some research, however, showing that mothers-in-law, that when, the fa- when the, you have a, a baby and two parents, when the father's mother is present, there's a much... The, there's a much higher incidence of death 
in the babies, I think it was. Oh, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. They looked at, you know, the figures in some German village, and, and uh, it seemed that the, the, when the mother's mother is part of the equation, then everyone benefits. When the father's mother is part of the equation, then the benefits are less doubtful. I mean, more doubtful. There's actually, yeah, that's actually um, a, an isolating technique that often, if you go back historically enough, you know, far enough, the young women are taken out of their family, away from their family, put into her husband's family. Right. And uh, historically, they were actually turned into slaves. Right. It still happens, right, in, in India and much of the Middle right, East. Right, right. Really oppressive. Darling, we're just about out of time. Is there anything you would like our listeners to know about your um, current activities? Or I, I know you don't um, have a website and maybe you um, don't want to give people a way to contact you, or maybe you do, but I'm going to give you that opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm always delighted if I've sparked anyone to um, any thoughts. I'd be delighted to hear. This is very much, you know, I'm trying to figure this out as we go along. That's why I really welcome the chance for this conversation. So if anyone's got anything to contribute, um, then to email you and to email me at cozyfabian at mindspring.com. That's C-O-S-I, Fabian at mindspring.com. Okay, and then you've got um, uh, some poetry that's been published. That there's a book out I there. Do, with... Yeah, I forget about all this stuff. You'll find me a real live me on a marvelous music DVD called One Giant Leap, uh, which has Michael Franti and all sorts of people on. It's a peace uh, theme DVD, One Giant Leap out of England. Uh, I have a, a an essay that proved quite important um, in a book that you're in too called Whores and Other Feminists, and I have an essay there um, called Holy Whore, which which has all the historical information that you've referred to, and how I use that in my life, and then I have uh, poems published in um, various volumes, including including one called In Her Words that was published by Shambhala, but uh, I think that's probably out of print. But I know some of my poems are floating out on, on the um, Internet there. Well, I know I, uh, I recite them at a lot of my lectures and workshops. So <laughs> I love it, yeah. No, so they're keeping it alive. And Horns and Other Feminists is edited by Jill Nagel. That came out of right. uh, Routledge um, Press. And, that uh, came out, yeah, about ten years ago. And also another recent book that I think is uh, worth people looking at called Stripping Sex and Popular Culture. And um, I, by a woman called Dr. Catherine Roach. She's a, a professor of comparative religion at a university, and a friend of hers became a stripper, and she didn't understand it and wanted to understand it. So we had extended conversations, and she talks a lot about my ideas of sacred prostitution and other things. So that stripping sex and popular culture, last name Roach is the author. Okay. That was recent. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Cozy. Um, you're an amazing one of a kind. Thank you, Veronica. And um, I, hope you'll, I hope you'll come back and be a guest again. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love All to. You right. can I be a guest. You, I love show. your guests, babe. Okay. Take care, Veronica. Bye bye, honey. Bye. Veronica Monet offers help, healing, and hope in the form of private telephone sessions. Email veronica at sexwithoutshame.com to schedule an appointment or visit www.sexwithoutshame.com to find out what Veronica can do for you.